Hello, my name is Louise McCluskey and I am going to present this A lecture on the design of unrestrained beams to your code today. This presentation deals with unrestrained beams and focuses on resistance to lateral torsion buckling. In lateral torsion buckling will not always be the critical failure mode, therefore checks for bending, shear, combined bending and shear and deflections should also be completed, and these topics are covered in the restrained beams presentation. This presentation is broken up into three sections, so an introduction which covers the theory about lateral torsional buckling, the design steps that you will need to complete um that you will need to complete to check a beam for resistance against LTV, and some examples at the end to help increase your understanding. So let's begin with the definition of LTV. When a load is applied to a beam, the top of the beam will be in compression and the bottom of the beam will be in tension, as illustrated by the top two diagrams. The tension force stretches the bottom of the beam and keeps it straight between the supports. On the top flange, the compression force can cause the top flange to buckle. Since the bottom of the flange is effectively restrained by the tension force, the beam can only buckle sideways and twist as shown in the bottom two diagrams. The buckling mode described in the previous slide is known as lateral torsional buckling, or LTB for short, and it occurs about the major axis. To illustrate the effect of LTB on a cantilever, we have this diagram on the left which shows the unloaded position of the beam and the buckle position. The photograph on the right is a real life model which shows the same buckle behaviour as drawn in the diagram. There are a number of cases when LTB can be discounted, and in those cases you should simply refer to the restrained beams lecture. So that's when sufficient lateral restraint is applied to compression flange, compression flange and I'll talk about that in more detail in the next slide. And since LTB occurs about the major axis, there is no need to consider it if bending occurs about the minor axis. And some sections have high lateral and torsional stiffness. Some examples include circular hollow sections, square hollow sections, or circular or square bar sections. Another case when LTB can be discounted is when the non-dimensional lateral torsional slenderness lambda bar LT is less than 0.2. The equation to calculate lambda bar LT is given later on in the design steps section of this presentation. And for quick reference, it's equation 656 in Eurocode 3, part 1 1. So, just to expand on the condition made in the previous slide that LTB can be discounted when there is sufficient lateral restraint to the compression flange, no guidance is given in Eurocode 3 as to what should be regarded as sufficient. Annex BB offers some guidance on the level of lateral restraint provided by trape trapezoidal, trapezoidal sheeting, but apart from that, any guidance is limited. It would be advisable in this case to refer back to BES 5950. Clauses 432 and 433 state that intermediate lateral restraints are required to be capable of resisting a total force of not less than 2.5% of the maximum design axial force in the compression flange within the relevant span, divided between the intermediate lateral restraints in proportion to their spacing. This slide shows some examples of fully restrained compression flanges. The first diagram is of an in-situ slab on top of the beam. The second diagram is of a precast concrete slab with in-situ infill. It's shown in the diagram that the frictional resistance between the concrete and the steel provides the lateral restraint. The third diagram shows precast concrete slabs with in situ infill on the shelf angles. It's important to note that even with the presence of lateral restraints, LTB can still occur between points of restraint, as illustrated in this diagram. It is therefore important that LTB checks are carried out on all unrestrained segments between points of lateral restraint. There are three possible methods to calculate the LTB resistance of a member. The method I will use in this presentation is the primary method which makes use of clause 6322 and 6323 in your code 3 and which use the buckling curves. Another method is the simplified assessment method which makes reference to clause 6324 but I would not recommend that method. And the final method is the general method which is covered in clause 634 and it deals with eigenvalue. So for someone familiar with using BS5950 you will find A is like the U, like U and V in the section tables. 
but in Euro Code 3, such simplifications do not appear. When it comes to working out the values of certain parameters needed to work out the LTB resistance of a member, there are two cases which need to be considered. And the first case is the general case, and that can be used for all sections. And the second case, which I shall refer to as the special case, in this presentation can only be used for rolled sections. This graph shows the difference in buckling curves for the general and special cases for buckling curve B. And as you can see, the special case for rolled sections is more favourable. You'll also notice that the plateau length has increased, therefore the use of the special case can provide significant increase in LTB resistance compared to using the general case. And you should also note that this um, graph is for comparison purposes only. Your code 3 does not give the graphs for the buckling curves. This is the equation that needs to be satisfied to show that the LTB resistance is acceptable. And it's equation 654 from clause 6321. And basically, what this expression is telling us is that the design moment, MED, should be less than the value of the design buckling resistance moment, MBRD. In the Eurocodes, you'll notice the subscripts are often related to the definition of the terms. So for the design buckling resistance, M tells, M tells you that it's the moment, B tells you that it's related to buckling, and RD tells you that it's the design resistance. So we know already that the design moment has to be less than the design buckling resistance moment. But how do we calculate the design buckling resistance moment, MBRD? Well, we use this expression 655 from clause 6321. And it tells us that the design buckling resistance moment is equal to chi LT times WY times FY over gamma M1. And you might notice that this is similar to the expression um, used for column buckling treatment, where the buckling resistance of the compression member, NBRD, is equal to chi times area times Fy over gamma M1, with the exception that the area A is placed with Wy and we're using chi LT instead of chi. The subscript LT used for chi is there to differentiate from the column buckling chi and it lets us know that we are dealing with lateral torsional buckling. Fy is the yield strength and the partial factor gamma M1 is equal to 1.